You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Corbett Report podcast after a very lengthy hiatus. Of course, I'm your host and navigator, as always, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com, joining you on this 30th day of May 2014 from the sunny climes of Western Japan. And you're in uh, in for a treat today. You are not only going to get a podcast, you are going to get a presentation, or at least what was intended to be so. Because you see, of course, as we are coming to you on the 30th of May 2014, it is not only the date on which the Bilderberg is meeting in downtown Copenhagen with, of course, 150 or so of the most wealthy and influential people in the Western world, including captains of industry, media moguls, financiers, government uh, bigwigs, and royalty, all rubbing elbows behind closed doors and out of sight of media scrutiny. But also, there is a We the People Bilderberg counter-conference that's taking place on the outskirts of Copenhagen and is attempting to do a the yeoman's work of, uh, of standing in protest and, and standing in uh, in opposition to that meeting and what it stands for that's going on right now behind the closed doors of the Marriott Hotel. It's the open doors of the We the People Bilderberg Conference, and I was due to give this presentation live uh, via Skype, but unfortunately the... The gods of Skype were not cooperating, so instead I'm recording this podcast and hopefully the conference organizers will still be able to use this video in some form for their conference. So with that out of the way, why don't we get into the meat and potatoes of this presentation? It is entitled, Why We Must Oppose Bilderberg. And that might sound a bit presumptuous because I assume if you are the type of person who is listening to this podcast in the first place, you are probably the type of person who already has a pretty good understanding of why we must oppose Bilderberg. And I'm sure you can think of many pretty good reasons just off the top of your head. And I am hardened to hear that, of course. I'm glad that there are more and more people waking up to the Bilderberg group and groups like it every single day and understand why this is something that needs to be opposed. So my hat's off to you if you already feel that you do have a lot of good answers to this question. But I think there are at least two good reasons for asking this question. And the first is so that we do have a good, documented, coherent answer that we can give for the people who are, well, maybe not so clued in. The people who prefer to blend in with the crowd, the people who look at the people who understand things about the Bilderberg Group and others as the crazy black sheep fringe lunatic conspiracy theorists or however they want to marginalize those who actually care about the world and the things that are actually taking place in it. Because unfortunately, although we are a growing crowd and uh, the choir is growing each and every day, we are still largely preaching to a choir. And it's important to remember, as I'm sure many of you do when you try to bring this subject up outside of your outside of your normal circles of friends and acquaintances, uh, just how few people really do understand these issues. So it is good to have a coherent answer for these people about why we should oppose the Bilderberg Group. And I think the other reason that we should have a, an answer of this for ourselves is that because this, the answer to this question, how we answer this question, very much affects the second question, the more important question that we'll have to ask once we answer this question, which is, how do we oppose the Bilderberg Group? So let's start providing an answer to this question for those out there who still don't quite understand why it is that this group, this completely secretive group that's been in existence for over 50 years and has spent almost the entirety of that time completely and utterly unknown to the public at large, uh, again, consisting of captains of industry, financiers, media moguls, government bigwigs, royalty, you name it, very important people from across the board. Why is it important that we understand about this? Well, of course, we can just listen to our government leaders to get that idea. This is a landmark event in the life of this, and I hope, all future governments. It is our ambition to be one of the most transparent governments in the world, open about what we do, and crucially, about what we spend. And today, you're going to see just how transformative our plans really are. Thank you. Well, I am, I am very honored uh, to be here and delighted uh, to be supporting the work of Transparency International USA uh, before government officials, 
uh, spoke as openly and uh, loudly about these issues. Uh, Transparency International was already bringing uh, corruption out of the shadows, uh, sunlight being the best disinfectant. Uh, And so I am really here first and foremost to thank all of you. To seize this moment, we have to use technology to open up our democracy. It's no coincidence that one of the most secretive administrations in our history has favored special interests and pursued policies that could not stand up to the sunlight. As president, I'm going to change that. Of course, transparency. Transparency, it makes sense. How could we possibly function with our democracies or representative governments without transparency? If there are people meeting behind closed doors in secret, well, it's quite obvious that we can't have anything resembling a representative government, right? Because these these government representatives are meeting behind closed doors with the, the captains of industry and others who want to, to influence the government to work for them. I mean, it just makes perfect sense. So, transparency being such a key part of the message and and a core part of the being of these people, these Obamas and these Clintons and these Camerons, these these political bigwigs who, who make it such a core part of their message when they're out on the campaign trail that they're committed to transparency, that's exactly why they so vehemently, vociferously, and on the record oppose something like the Bilderberg Group. Wait, just a... Oh, sorry. Oh. I'm getting word that actually all three of them have actually attended the Bilderberg Group. Uh, After the scandals which we heard about in the Lords uh, last week, uh, David Cameron said he was going to set up measures to ensure uh, that there was proper regulation of lobbyists and in particular transparency. If there is any conference which required transparency, which required democratic accountability, it is the Bilderberg Conference because this is really where the top brass of Western finance capitalism meet uh, in order to make their deals, listen to each other, lobby, including uh, government ministers, particularly George Osborne and Kenneth Clark. And as far as I know, there will be no statement in the House uh, following it uh, saying what happened and how it might affect government policy. This is totally in contradiction. Uh, to the government's commitment uh, to have greater transparency. George Osborne said in 2010 that he was committed to the most transparent agenda this country had ever seen. On the campaign trail in 2008, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama disappeared for a secret meeting near Washington. Their private limos were seen entering the Chantilly, Virginia hotel where the Bilderberg meeting was taking place that same day. The Associated Press has learned that Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton have met face to face. The closed door meeting comes just days after Obama clinched the Democratic nomination and just one day after Hillary Clinton's campaign announced she's planning to drop out of the presidential race. Campaign aides for both candidates say the meeting was about unity. Initially, it was believed that the secret meeting took place at Clinton's Washington, D.C. home. Obama's spokesman denied that, but won't confirm where the former rivals met. Robert, why were we not told about this meeting and that the senator wouldn't be on our flight until the doors were shut and we were about to taxi to take off. Again, uh, 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 you know, uh, we had a desire, Senator Obama had a desire to do some meetings, others had a desire to meet with him tonight in a private way, and that's what we're doing. We witnessed at least seven convoys of armed secret service entering the Westfields Marriott, and internal sources confirm that both candidates did attend at least one meeting inside the conference. What? You mean we can't trust the Clintons and Obamas and Camerons of the world to be truthful and forthcoming about their behind-closed-door meetings? You mean they're maybe not all that committed to transparency in the first place? The transparency that they admit is the only disinfectant to the secrecy and corporate lobbying which will undermine the entire idea of representative government to the extent that we want that in the en- in the end anyway. Yes, imagine that. Well, uh, it-, it is obviously and you know, on its face a complete breach of the public's trust that uh, these politicians continue to lie shamefacedly about their commitment to such things as transparency as they meet behind closed doors at such groups as the Bilderberg Group. 
But it isn't just about trust, at least not in the U.S. context, because in the U.S. specifically, it's actually a felony law for these politicians to be meeting behind closed doors with foreign government officials. Uh, this goes back to something called the Logan Act, which was first instituted in 1798 by President Adams against a Pennsylvanian representative named Logan, who was a, a local representative who went on to become a U.S. senator. And he, at the time, was a pacifist who was found to be negotiating in private with certain French officials during the quasi-war there at the end of the 18th century. And President Adams was so infuriated that someone would be going behind the American government's back to be negotiating with an enemy that he instituted the Logan Act. Now, the interesting thing about the Logan Act is it's never been used, so we'll, uh, we'll have to keep that in mind. But let's just read about this Logan Act. Quote, under the Logan Act, a U.S. law passed during the infancy of the country by President John Adams, American citizens cannot negotiate with foreign officials without the authorization of the country. According to the text of the Logan Act of 1799, quote, any citizen of the United States, wherever he may be, who, without authority of the United States, directly or indirectly, commences or carries on any correspondence or intercourse with any foreign government or any officer or agent thereof, with intent to influence the measures or conduct of any foreign government or of any officer or agent thereof in relation to any disputes or controversies with the United States, or to defeat the measures of the United States, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than three years, or both." End quote. Well, that's pretty powerful. That's pretty cut and dry. It's pretty black and white that, yes, all of the U.S. government officials, at any rate, who are meeting behind closed doors at Bilderberg, should be fined, if not imprisoned, for their actions. And in fact, the multiple violators would deserve to have multiple felony counts levied against them if this was a system which was based on the rule of law. But unfortunately, if you're watching the Corporate Report podcast again, you probably know that this system is not based on the rule of law. So it is quite unfortunate that the Logan Act has never and likely will never be used to prosecute anyone attending the Bilderberg Group or any of these other secret groups and meetings that go on. Because, of course, the police are just there to maintain the status quo and to follow the orders of the people who are controlling them, the people who are paying their checks, the people who are attending the Bilderberg, amongst other things. So, again, I don't think we can look for justice in this regard, but it is important to understand that, at the very least, there is a legal aspect to these types of closed-door meetings. It is illegal for these representatives to be meeting under the Logan Act, which is a felony, uh, felony law under U.S. government law, so... So at any rate, it does apply to U.S. government officials, or it should. And that's one way that we could at least start to answer why we must oppose Bilderberg. And for those of you living in countries where you cannot point to something similar like the Logan Act to explain why it is or should be illegal for your representatives to be meeting behind closed doors, you might want to think long and hard about why it is that this isn't illegal in every country around the world. But let's move on. So... We have the closed door meeting that we know is taking place. And why do we care what's happening behind those closed doors? Yes, of course, there's wheelers and dealers. And yes, so, you know, there's the bull boys club. And yes, they're, they're slapping backs and uh, greasing palms and doing deals. We know that takes place to a certain extent. We'd be naive to think otherwise. But that's just the way it works. It's the way it's always worked. Why should we care what's going on behind that closed door? I mean... Did you hear Brad Pitt just got punched by some random person who broke into a movie premiere or something? I mean, that must be the what leads the news, right? Why, why do we care about what's going on behind closed doors? Well, to start answering that question, why don't we go and take a look at the roots of the Bilderberg Group? And we'll start by taking a look at this logo. I'm sure some of you out there in the audience will probably immediately be able to recognize this logo, but before we get into exactly what it is and why it's important, why don't we just examine this logo for a moment? Of course, here we have the image of a man riding a white horse, and the white horse, of course, could be seen as a symbol of one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the white horse being the horse of conquest. And the Horse of Conquest is rearing up over a banner which reads V-B-I-Q-V-E, which is ubiqui, which in uh, the English language is the root word of ubiquitous, which might give a hint as to what it means. It is, of course, a word that means everywhere. What we have here is an image of conquest 
everywhere. And what is this the logo of? Oh, of course, it's the Council on Foreign Relations, founded back in the early 1920s, founded out of the uh, working groups that were working in the the, uh, the Versailles-Paris uh, Accords in 1919, and of course co-founded at about the same time as the Royal Institute of International Affairs, one of its many brother organizations and sister organizations around the world, That the Royal Institute of International Affairs being based, of course, in Britain. But the Council on Foreign Relations has an interesting history in a lot of different ways, and one that actually relates in some ways to the kernel of the idea that became Bilderberg eventually. And for this, we can go all the way back to the Second World War, where back in 1939, as early as 1939, before the U.S. was even involved in the war, the CFR had founded something that they called the War and Peace Studies Group. This was founded, as I say, in 1939 and continued its work until 1945, funded with some $350,000 provided by the Rockefeller Foundation. Now, this group petitioned for the, st the State Department to create a committee that would set America's post-war foreign policy uh, and to be uh, provided with research by the CFR study group. And that's exactly what happened. In March of 1942, the State Department set up just such a committee. It was indeed furnished with research by the CFR's War and Peace Studies Group, making in all... Uh, and all, for all manners, uh, intents, and purposes, the CFR, an adjunct of the U.S. State Department or, or a member of the U.S. government in, in some functional capacity there for that key period of 1942 to 1945, in which it provided literally hundreds of pieces of research, including papers and, uh, and policy papers and others, that were provided again to the State Department through that committee that was set up in March 1942. And what actually resulted from that? Well, among other bodies, such august bodies as the UN's World Bank and International Monetary Fund, which were both heavily levied, uh, proposed and levied for by the group in 1941, 1942, including with articles in, its, uh, in the Council on Foreign Relations Foreign Affairs publication, it was also uh, the, the place where in the, the early 1940s, there was a heavy emphasis placed on the idea that there would need to be, in the post-war period, more of a consensus along the transatlantic lines, i.e. the United States, Canada, should be more in line with Europe when it comes to foreign policy decisions. And of course, that only makes sense in an environment, a post-war environment, in which the transatlantic relationship was being cemented in a lot of very concrete ways, not least of which, of course, being the cementing of of the NATO treaty in 1949. And so it was that the kernel for the idea of what became the Bilderberg Group was actually proposed by the CFR, CFR's War and Peace Studies Group, working as the research arm of a U.S. State Department committee in the early 1940s during the war. And that idea persisted. It what didn't necessarily originate from that group, and it didn't certainly didn't end there, and it was taken up by others, but it did start to become something that was uh, very, very much taken up as a cause by other people. And when we start to look at the people who actually went on to found the Bilderberg Group, we can look at such people as these. And just looking at the pictures, can you identify who we're talking about? Likely not. In fact, before I looked up these pictures, I certainly would, probably would have failed this test as well. But on the left-hand side of the screen, we are looking at Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, someone whose name often comes up in relation to the founding of the Bilderberg Group. And he is certainly one of the best known of the founding members of this group, and perhaps for good reason. Of course, Prince Bernard is well known for his Nazi proclivities, which he denied all of his life. But in 2010, a Dutch historian uncovered documents proving that he was a member of the Nazi fraternity Deutsche Studentschafte. He was a member of the Nazi NSDAP and its paramilitary wing, the Sturmabteilung. So these connections have been downplayed by people who point to Prince Bernard's wartime record. He opposed the Nazis. He was an anti-Nazi through and through. He may have had to have joined certain organizations in his youth to go along, to get along. But when, it came, when, the, when the rubber met the road, he, he showed his true grit and he was an anti-Nazi. Uh, but uh, hold on. In 2007, there was mainstream coverage of a scandal that, that broke because of some Dutch journalists who, again, uncovered some documents that proved that when he was on the board of KLM, he was using that position on the board to pet petition Switzerland to help 
Nazis escape uh, to South America after the war. So again, another huge scandal that somehow or other managed to get mostly swept under the rug, and people still tend to think of Prince Bernard not really as a Nazi. Those are just smears, even though there's multiple lines of evidence showing that he was on board with the Nazis. And it is another line that we could take to pursue that's quite interesting that, in fact, it was 1934 in which he dropped his membership of those Nazi organizations that we we mentioned earlier when he went to join the German industrial giant, IG Farben. And IG Farben is particularly an interesting organization for a number of reasons that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. But one of them is that uh, because in 2009, there was a researcher who uncovered documents relating to a meeting that took place in August of 1944 where the Nazis were uh, meeting with some of the top industrial and business leaders of Germany at the Maison Rouge Hotel in Strasbourg, and what resulted is what's called the Red House Meeting, at which representatives of such groups as IG Farben were discussing with top, top Nazi generals who understood that Germany was going to lose the war, that in order to form a Fourth Reich, the uh, German business elite would have to start basically transferring, transferring their wealth out through neutral countries like Switzerland and setting up front organizations across Europe in the hope of eventually setting up a pan-European institution that would become the Fourth Reich. And the Fourth Reich would not be a military organization like the Third Reich, it would be a financial one and it would be pan-European in nature. Hmm, does that sound familiar to anyone? Well, enter the person on the right side of this screen, the much less well-known one, Joseph Redinger. And uh, Redinger is perhaps familiar in certain contexts as a key member of the European movement that spawned the European Union. He was one of the people who initiated the first Bilderberg meeting in 1954. He brought Prince Bernhard and others on board with the idea, including then-CIA head Walter Bedell Smith, who consulted with the State Department and the President about the idea, and former Belgian Prime Minister Paul von Zeeland amongst others. So these are two people who have very interesting histories, who were there at the beginning, at the formation of the uh, the Bilderberg Group. And of course, what did we get from the very foundation, the very inception of the Bilderberg Group? We got the idea that the group was working towards well, world domination, ultimately, but a very specific type of world domination. This isn't just the uh, the crazy ideas of some crazy scientist with a big map in his drawing room, as we would be led to believe by Hollywood characters. This is actually a very detailed and very, uh, very uh, insidious plan that involved the merging of political, economic, and social inst institutions across the Atlantic uh, through the transatlantic partnerships that were being formed during this period into a fascistic corporate governmental structure. And we can get glimpses of this from the documentary record that exists of the early Bilderberg meetings, including snippets of audio recordings that have finally come to light of the very first Bilderberg meeting in Oosterbeck, the Netherlands, at the Bilderberg Hotel in 1954, including a very interesting presentation delivered by Gardner Cowles, an American attendee of the first Bilderberg conference, who talked a little bit about the notion of a shared foreign policy across the Atlantic. I think I should say frankly that we in the United States feel a sense of insecurity for perhaps the first time in our history. We're deeply disturbed that uh, there seems to be no unity among our European friends with us in the question of what should be done in Asia. This raises the question, of course, of a unified foreign policy for the Atlantic nations to underlie that NATO military pact that had just been signed a few years earlier, as we talked about. And it also harkens back to the CFR's War and Peace Studies Group's recommendation for exactly this type of body that, uh, that the Bilderberg was to become, which is a, a body for an institution or a, a grouping for people to talk 
uh, people in positions of power and influence to talk about these transatlantic alliances and how it can be shaped into a coherent foreign policy. Well, just a decade after the CFR's War and Peace Studies Group was proposing it, here is people like Gardner Cowles and Prince Bernard and Joseph Redinger and many, many others sitting there discussing exactly that, how they can more closely meld the foreign policy aims and objectives of the Atlantic nations, including, of course, the United States and Canada and all of the European nations who are convening at Bilderberg, or more accurately, the the would-be ruling oligarchs, the powers that shouldn't be over top of those nations. So it was that in 1955, the Bilderbergers met twice, in fact, and the third ever Bilderberg meeting occurred in September of 1955, the second taking place earlier in the year. And the third meeting was, uh, the, the meeting minutes have since been leaked. They are available online, and of course, I'll link to them at CorbettReport.com so that you can actually find them and read them for yourself. But there are some pretty interesting snippets from those leaked documents, including uh, the fact that the Bilderbergers were talking quite frankly about the, quote, pressing need to bring the German people, together with the other peoples of Europe, into a common market, end quote, which is, again, perhaps particularly significant in the context of that Nazi Red House meeting that we talked about earlier in Strasbourg in 1944, where they talked about how the fact that the German people, amongst the other peoples of Europe, would only be able to uh, bring about that Fourth Reich, that, uh, that that political power structure that uh, was envisioned as the replacement for the Third Reich through a European con- common market. Well, what were remarkably similar languages being used here? And then, of course, the uh, leaked documents also reveal, quote, a plan to arrive in the shortest possible time at the highest degree of integration beginning with a common European market. That sounds like a pretty concise and coordinated and very well thought out agenda. And wouldn't you know it, lo and behold, just two years after that conference, there they are at the Treaty of Rome, signing the very documents that would become the foundation for the European Union. Wow, who would have thunk it? And just to put the icing on the cake and just to make sure that we understand who is really behind this initiative, of course, we should understand that many of the signers of the Treaty of Rome, including uh, Paul uh, Henry de Spock, I believe was his name, uh, was... Uh, Bilderberg attendee. So again, we have the actual Bilderberg attendees proposing the formation of a European common market uh, as the f- stepping stone towards the cl- the highest degree of integration um, possible with, uh, across Europe. And then two years later, they're the ones sitting around the table signing the documents to make it all official. So I think we understand where this process is all heading. But again, just to make it very clear, in the 1990s, we got the cherry on the Sunday when we had, for example, Etienne d'Avignon, the former EU commissioner and also a Bilderberg steering committee member, talking about the fact that the Bilderberg had a hand in the process of the creation of the Eurozone and the Euro currency. In fact, it was vital in the deliberation period of that uh, the run-up to the implementation of the Eurozone. And this is, again, not conspiracy. This is not something we just have to guess about. This is something that Etienne d'Avignon openly admitted back in 2009 to the EU Observer in an interview where he said, quote, When we were having debates on the euro, people at Bilderberg events could explain why it was worth taking risks, and the others, for whom the formal policy was not to believe in it, were not obliged not to listen and had to stand up and come up with real arguments i.e. the idea, which is often floated by members of Bilderberg, that well, for the policy decisions are not made here. There's not, not any substantive uh, uh, agreements or arrangements that are made at these. these is, it's just a talking shop. It's just a place where people exchange ideas. Well, that is given the lie, at the very least, by statements like this one, as well as by statements like former NATO Secretary General William Willie Claus, who... Uh, spoke in a radio interview a few years ago saying that, of course, we go home and implement the ideas that we talked about during the meetings. So again, giving the lie to the idea that Bilderberg is just an innocent talking shop. So the next logical step that is now being taken to connect the regional governments and uh, to create that that larger sense of a shared, not just foreign policy, but economic, governmental, and, and uh, corporate and, and military structure is, of course, happening right now in the TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is a transatlantic counterpart to the equally secretive and equally worrying Trans-Pacific Partnership that 
is seeking to create a free trade area in the Asia-Pacific region. The TTIP between the EU and the U.S. has been called by Bilderberg attendee David Cameron as quote, the biggest bilateral trade deal in history, and it is being hammered out as we speak, and naturally, it is being discussed, one would only assume, at meetings like the one that is taking place right now in Copenhagen, behind the closed doors of the Marriott Hotel, where many of the key officials who are talking about and deliberating in these uh, deliberations are, in fact, now rubbing elbows with each other over cocktails. Again, anyone who is not worried about that situation simply is not paying attention. But again, we might hear the argument, so what? So who cares? This is just the way business functions. This is the way it happens. Get used to it. Yes, it's an old boys club, and yes, they all go and mingle, and uh, they all share share their uh, little uh, cocktails, and they all have their their little fun at their party, and they, they... do a few deals behind closed doors, but what's so special about about this meeting, about this Bilderberg that takes place? Well, two things. Firstly, we can very much say with a great degree of confidence that the agenda of the Bilderberg group is aggressively and explicitly corporate fascist in nature, and To get an idea of that, you can take a look at the image like the one that is being displayed right now. Now, you can't possibly make out the detail of that image because it is much, much, much too large to really encapsulate in uh, in, on the screen. But I, of course, will show uh, put a link in the show notes so you can go and take a look at this entire uh, graph for yourself and see how the core members of the Bilderberg group there in the inner circle, those people all branch out and have multiple interlocking connections to all of those hundreds and hundreds of corporations that ring the outside of that group, i.e. the Bilderberg Group can be seen, can be visualized as a web of connections between this corporate fascist global government that is forming. It is nothing less than a, than a, a complete integration of the business, financial, and governmental functions as exemplified as personified in these people who are meeting at the Bilderberg group. Now, again, this is not just metaphorical. This is not something we have to guess at. We can look at the specific documentary record for more evidence of what this global fascistic agenda really is about and what it is aiming for by looking, for example, at the the transcripts and meeting minutes of the 1968 Bilderberg conference that took place in Canada, at which George Ball, who's Middle name is actually Wildman. You cannot make this stuff up. George Wildman Ball. He gave a a talk on the internationalization of business. And he was speaking of which, where he knew, of what he knew, uh, insofar as he was not only an undersecretary of state for economic affairs under both Kennedy and Johnson, but he was also a managing director for Lehman Brothers and uh, Kuhn Loeb Inc., and also a member of the steering committee of the Bilderberg Group. So a very interesting person with a lot of interesting connections himself. And the speech that he delivered, the internationalization of business was particularly chilling in its scope and implications, laying out a concept of a new economic world order that would be based on the concept of a world company. Uh, It required the elimination of the nation-state as a prerequisite to the implementation of this plan, and as Ball himself asked, according to the meeting's transcripts, quote, where does one find a legitimate base for the power of corporate managements to make decisions that can profoundly affect the economic life of nations to whose government they have only limited responsibility. This is the Bilderberg vision of globalization, not the fuzzy-wuzzy, loving, friendly trade and cooperation between nations that they like to present to us, but the global fascistic corporate takeover that this really is and that they will never tell us about. And uh, unfortunately, it is only ever revealed in snippets when some of the goings on of these the the meetings of the Bilderberg and other such uh, organizations finally do come to light. So that's one thing to understand about why it is important that we understand what they're doing behind these closed doors. The other thing to note about this process that it is again it is aggressively and unashamedly conspiratorial. We have 150 of the wealthiest and most influential people in the western world meeting in total secrecy and without even the possibility that the media will cover them because the media are part of it. 
senior media officials and executives attend these meetings and agree not to report on what goes on behind those doors. And this secrecy on which the Bilderberg Group and groups like it function is not just coincidental, it is absolutely an a fundamental part of the existence of this group. Their entire existence is predicated on secrecy, as revealed by, well, Prince Bernhard himself, again from that leaked recording of the 1954 conference. Gentlemen, may I bid you all welcome here and say one word before I start speaking. Uh, I am starting speaking, and that is the uh, translation Button number two is French and number three is English. You may wonder why I have asked you to come here. I have in mind a completely frank and open exchange of views, and this is ensured to you, and it is essential for our success. There is no verbatim quotation of anybody, and there is no press, so you are quite free to let yourselves go, if I may say so. Some very revealing words, and again, I think this goes to the heart of the issue that right from the very outset of the first meeting of this group, Prince Bernhard and the other founding members understood that secrecy was absolutely essential to these plans, that they could not go ahead without being assured that that secrecy would be respected and maintained. Secrecy is absolutely essential to their existence, and as such, the corollary is that if secrecy is the the central beating heart of their, their, their group and their aims and their plans, then exposure is obviously the antidote. Their downfall hinges on that exposure. And on that note, of course, we have made great strides in recent years in exposing this group and its activities, at the very least its existence, which has been largely covered up for decades. And this work has this yeoman's work of exposing the group's existence and some of the activities that they have done behind those closed doors falls to those int- brave few intrepid reporters who managed to follow uh, the, the, the actual trail of cookie crumbs to find the, uh, the gingerbread house itself, as it were, and to actually start to dismantle it and understand what is behind it. And of course, we can look back to some of the, the shoulders of giants that we are all now currently standing on and which inform so much of what we understand about this group, looking all the way back to Westbrook Pegler, the first journalist to actually write about the group just a few years after it was first formed, and it was his coverage that eventually got Jim Tucker involved in covering the group. And of course, people will remember the late Jim Tucker, who was a previous guest on The Corbett Report, and perhaps much more importantly, spent uh, upwards of three decades chasing the Bilderbergers around the world, meeting, uh, chasing after them and covering their meetings every single year, wherever they decided to meet. And always getting the inside sources and documents on those meetings. And of course, Daniel Estelin literally writing the book, the book on the Bilderberg Group. So again, we owe so much to the work of these people and the the research that they've managed to do and what they've managed to uncover. And of course, it is that time to turn the torch over to a new generation of young intrepid reporters who are continuing that tradition and continuing to try to expose the work of these people course, we're talking about such people as, well, um, as you may have known, uh, Dan Dix of uh, PressForTruth.ca and Luke Rukowski of WeAreChange.org, who, of course, were both recently arrested just a few days ago for daring to attempt to talk to one of the uh, Bilderberg organizers or a group of the Bilderberg organizers there in the Marriott Hotel before they closed it off to the public and uh, luckily released without charges so that they could continue to cover this conference. But again, that should show where the real power lies is in the power to tell people, uh, the, the people who put people in behind bars who to put behind bars. Don't put the people who are violating the Logan Act behind bars. Put people who are ta- daring to try to talk to some of these Bilderberg representatives behind bars. Yes, that makes sense. Well, it makes sense when we understand what the real power structure is. Of course, Charlie Skelton of The Guardian also doing excellent work, writing some very important stories. I hope people are keeping track of Charlie Skelton's work. And of course, Charlie himself, no stranger to the, uh, well, the police uh, shenanigans that goes on around these conferences. And of course, he first covered it back in 2009 in Vulamini, Greece, 
where he was exposed himself to the types of persecution that uh, reporters unfortunately increasingly suffer when trying to bring and uh, some some light to this subject. But uh, but again, we are making progress. We have made incredible strides in the seven years that I've been covering the Bilderberg Group. Back when I had to explain in great detail what the group was, its history, who formed it, and, and why, and how, I had to explain that over and over because so few people had actually heard of this group or what it did. That has changed dramatically, and we do have more people who have heard about it now, even if they are those those uh, those masses of white sheep who uh, are just bleat uh, at the at the few black sheep in the crowd. Oh, you're scared of those builder burgers with cheese. Ha ha ha. Well, well, yes, there is still considerable progress to be made in that task of exposing these these doings and dealings to the light of day. And don't worry, we have a secret weapon in this fight. You. Yes, you, you, specifically, of course, you sitting there in Copenhagen at the We the People Bilderberg conference who can help to turn this around, the people who can who can really make a difference there on the ground and actually uh, to, to be the physical testament to the fact that the people cannot and will not stand for the types of uh, backroom deals that go on at these conferences. So you and uh, you, the viewer at home, who's taken the time to actually sit through a presentation like this and imbibe some of this information and take it on board and understand more about this world and how it works. And you, as in me, as in all of us, every single one of us who has access to this information and understands why we must oppose Bilderberg, you are going to be ultimately part of the solution. And that solution, again, the question why we must oppose them, because they are operating completely in secret with utter impunity. And again, what is the answer to that? How do we effectively oppose them? We expose them. We have to expose their dealings and we have to expose them to the greater light of scrutiny because just like a magician's trick, if we don't know what they have up their sleeve, then they can pull it out at any time and shock and surprise and delight who they want. And if we do know what's up their sleeve and we can explain it beforehand to the audience, the entire power of their trick is completely broken in their face. And that is exactly what we have to do. It's what we're doing with such things as false flag terrorism, which is becoming a less effective tool because people are more aware of it. And it is what is happening to groups like the Bilderberg, which are finding it more and more difficult to find a moment's respite, a moment's peace away from these protesters during their Bilderberg uh, weekends away, that it is unlikely that they are even seriously treating the Bilderberg in the way that they would have 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. Now, it may more be a, a type of talking shop or a weekend away, and the real dealings, again, are going even further underground. That is not an excuse for us to just throw up our hands and say there's nothing we can do. It's an excuse for us to go even further, because these people are not immortal, they are not omnipotent, they can be brought down. There are 6,000 of them, according to Henry Kissinger minion uh, David Rothkopf, who wrote Superclass. There are about 6,000 of these operators, these super gophers who can run around the world and pretend to direct things by being on the boards of various groups and companies and governmental organizations and what have you. 6,000 of them and over 7 billion of us us, free humanity, who do not have to sit down and take it. There are many, 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 many more of us than there are of them, and we have to understand that. We have to start visualizing that to understand the power that we have in these situations. Look at this picture. This is an exact picture of the situation. In fact, it's even more overwhelming if you were to actually do this statistically of the 6,000 or so of the superclass versus the 7 billion of humanity. The superclass would be the tiniest of tiny dots in the center of that picture, and the mass of people around them would be literally overwhelming, uncountable, unbelievable, unseeable. And that's the truth about what the, the situation that exists. And until we start taking that on board and start living as if we understood that fact and that we could start to grow around the groups like the Bilderbergs and others that are trying to control these organizations that are trying to have control over us. Until we really take this on board, we will not have victory. And when we do take it on board, victory is assured. 
Thank you very much for listening, folks. Once again, this is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. I really do appreciate you sitting around for this presentation. And again, I really do believe that you are part of the answer. So please do what you can to help spread this information to others in whatever form you think is best. And once again, I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Thanking you for joining me. And I'm looking forward to talking to you all again real soon. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.